I'd like to call the committee to order and uh, welcome everyone to this morning's hearing on globalization of American universities and the impact on national competitiveness. I want to offer uh, welcome to our distinguished witnesses, all leaders and experts on the emerging trend of university globalization. And uh, we look forward to hearing your thoughts on the globalization of universities' implications for American competitiveness. Uh, Chairman Gordon, did you want to offer some comments? I know you have to leave early. Did you want to offer some comments before I offer my introductory remarks? So. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, and I thank you for continuing on. As you know, this is a very important issue to us. We've been working on this, this in a bipartisan way for the last few years. Uh, I'm very hopeful that we are close to an agreement with the uh, Senate on our competitiveness uh, Bill, I know that you're very aware of the rising above the gathering storm, and I think we're going to be able to, to get that done. I hope that you'll soon see the results of it and may come back and visit us uh, in a year or so to you know, let us know how it's working, how to fine-tune, and how we need to, to move beyond that. Uh, today is also going to be a very interesting um, hearing concerning uh, STEM education. Uh, as we know, um, just to get a a STEM education these days, even from a, a, a substantial university like we have here today, is no guarantee of a, a lifetime of good employment. And so we want to learn more about that. We want to learn what you're learning from overseas uh, and maybe lessons that can be brought home to us. So again, we thank you uh, for being here. And as the Chairman Baird said, I, I, I have a markup shortly and I'll have to, to leave, but I will be staying in touch and want to learn more about what you have to say. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Gordon, as you all know, has been a, just a, a fantastic leader along with Ranking Member Hall and uh, Mr. Ehlers and others on both sides in a bipartisan way and expanding STEM education in a host of important ways. We're grateful for you. Uh, as you all know, corporations have been globalizing for decades, and we know the effects on U.S. competitiveness are complex, including positives such as lower prices for consumers, but also some negatives as job and uh, wage loss have impacted other American workers. But we know relatively little about how university globalization will impact America's competitiveness. America's higher education system is a principal source of our preeminence in science, technology, engineering, and math fields, so-called STEM fields. And as The Economist reports, U.S. higher education is the best in the world, home to 17 of the top 20 universities and 70% of the world's Nobel Prize winners. I think we swept those prizes last year, in fact. The National Science Board reports that American academics produce 30% of the world's science and engineering articles. However, offshoring is reshaping how and where STEM education work is done. As a result, international competition has shifted increasingly to the individual worker level, and multinational companies are responding to competition by using more workers in lower-cost countries. Those companies' American workforce now compete against workers in low-cost nations like China and India. American workers must respond by either increasing their productivity or lowering their wages. Obviously, the only acceptable solution is for our workers to increase productivity, but this is becoming more difficult as a larger share of jobs become vulnerable to offshoring. And many of our workers' traditional advantages, infrastructure, better tools and technology, proximity to the largest consumer market, are also being eroded. Therefore, our higher education system will become even more critical, a, an even more critical factor in helping American workers differentiate themselves from workers in lower cost countries. At the same time, American universities are beginning to globalize in new ways, which we will hear from today. With many more jobs requiring international work teams, universities are preparing their STEM students by providing more international experience through study abroad and other cross-border collaborations. Universities are also modifying their STEM curricula to better prepare students for jobs that will stay in America. In some respects, American universities have been global for many, many years. We have attracted large numbers of foreign students, particularly in STEM fields at the graduate level. But offshoring is giving high-quality foreign students outstanding job, job opportunities in their home countries. This makes it less li may make it less likely that foreign students will stay in the U.S. after graduation and may make it less desirable to come to the U.S. to study in the first place. Therefore, American universities are taking their education to the foreign students by building campuses and offering STEM degree programs in other countries. Today we'll hear from what our witnesses have to say about the trends, motivations, and consequences of globalization of universities on our U.S. science and engineering enterprise, its workforce, and our nation's competitiveness. With that, I'd like to now recognize my friend and colleague, Ranking Member uh, Mr. Hall from Texas for an opening statement. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. You've covered it very well, and I'm amazed at the uh, members, the gentlemen we have before us here, their background, their ability, and their willingness to give. Uh, certainly uh, <clears throat> know that there's no doubt that 
the American higher education system is, is one of our nation's crown jewels. And an increasing demand for U.S. degrees and escalating use of our higher education system as a model by other countries reflects uh, decades of hard work and investment uh, by the American people and by dedicated professionals like you four men on the panel and others that will be before us. Uh, while congratulations are in order, I think we shouldn't take care not to rest on our laurels while the world around us continues to invest and improve their research and educational facilities. To get today, I look forward to discussing uh, one way in which the U.S. institutions of higher education are trying to continue their record of leadership. Scores of universities are now looking overseas for opportunities to expand. Many have partnered with foreign universities to offer joint programs and degrees, while others have opened new branches complete with classrooms, laboratory space, and dormitories. Some universities offer a limited curriculum overseas and require students to com uh, complete their training in the U.S., while others offer complete degree uh, programs abroad. Uh, this wide range of uh, models makes it difficult, I think, to confidently predict how the globalization of higher education might affect U.S. institutions and the U.S. economy overall. However, we have a panel before us today that can help us map out the pros and cons of, of these uh, trends. In addition to the schools represented here today, I'd like to take a moment to mention the work of Texas A&M in some faraway areas. Uh, I uh, think that it's highlighted by the Excuse me, highlighted in the American Council of Education uh, report, venturing abroad, delivering U.S. degrees through overseas branch campuses and programs. Uh, started under the presidency of Secretary of Defense Robert Gates, Texas A&M continues to build a substantial engineering program in these areas. The inaugural class began in September of 2003 with 29 students and has grown from there. Currently, Texas A&M offers four engineering degrees in this one area and one location uh, with a faculty of 52 and student body of 200. Uh, this coursework meets the same standards of those in College Station, including a course on Texas history. I uh, hope he leaves out the part that uh, Sam Houston had to burn the bridge to be assured that his folks wouldn't abandon him till the war, till the battle was over, and, and had to tell him there was no retreat. Now, that's kind of embarrassing as I look back on it. But uh, <laughs> there, and I've had a lot of people. Uh, I'd said Tennesseans and and uh, folks from Kentucky really saved Texas. They really, but for them, there wouldn't be any Texas and. The answer, I think, uh, Chairman Barton gave to me, what there wouldn't be a Texas anyway if the Alamo had, had a back door in it. So I don't <laughs> know if that's so or not, but we're going to stand up for Texas. There are a few questions that I'm eager to have addressed today. First of all, who are the students that take advantage of U.S. programs abroad, and where do they go after graduation? Do significant work numbers work for American firms after graduation, either in their home country or in the U.S.? Do more U.S. students abroad uh, study abroad when uh, branch campuses are available. Next, I'm interested in our panel's thoughts on the ability of, of their international efforts to serve as centers for business development. Do these centers provide a foot in the door for U.S. businesses, or do they largely stimulate growth only within the foreign country? Uh, finally, I think we should also consider the role these international arrangements have in further projecting America's image. Many of these programs are located in areas of the world where the U.S. has a strategic interest in being on the ground. These are some questions that I think probably you will answer, and I look forward to hearing them. I do uh, look forward to your testimony for the opportunity to continue this discussion during the question. And, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank you, Mr. Holland. Uh, as is the custom of this uh, committee, if other members wish to offer opening statements for the records, we will accept those them into the records. Again, I'm very delighted by this extremely distinguished and accomplished uh, panel of experts here to enlighten us. Uh, Dr. David Scorton is president of Cornell University. Dr. Gary Schuster is provost and vice president for academic affairs at Georgia Institute of Technology. Mr. Mark Wessel is dean of the Heinz School of Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University. Dr. Philip Altbach is Mon Monin Professor of Higher Education and Director of the Center for International Higher Education at Boston College. Thank you, gentlemen, very much for being here as we discuss the uh, 
custom of the panelists, uh, the committee is to allow five minutes of testimony, far too brief for something that's important, but that will be followed by a very good give and take. There's a small box on your table there that uh, illustrates when your time is running low, and as my dear friend Dr. Ehlers used to say, uh, if the, we pass much past five minutes, a trap door emerges and you disappear. Something you wish you had in your faculty meetings, I'm sure. Uh, uh, please, uh, we'll begin with Dr. Scorton, and uh, thank you all for being here. And Good morning, Chairman Baird, Ranking Member Hall, and members of the community. My name is David Scorton. I'm president of Cornell University. I want to start, Mr. Hall, by saying that uh, Cornell does not have a position on Texas history at the Alamo. <laughs> Cornell is located in Ithaca, New York, with campuses or programs in New York City, Geneva, New York, Appledore Island, Maine, Arecibo, Puerto Rico, France, England, Italy, Singapore, China, Tanzania, Qatar, and 45 other countries as Cornell abroad destinations. It is not only the largest and most comprehensive school in the Ivy League, it is also the land-grant university for New York State. Our enrollment is approximately 20,000 with students from every state and more than 3,000 students from 120 other countries studying under an internationally renowned faculty. We are one of the most international of American universities. I thank you for having the hearing and for inviting me to share one university's perspective on the globalization of research, development, and innovation. You have asked us to address three questions. The first regarding our motivations and decision factors in establishing overseas branch campuses. The second, how our internationalization impacts the global research enterprise, and the third, how we prepare our students to compete in a globalized marketplace. The most important message, though, that I want to emphasize today is the enormous role higher education plays and can play in intercultural exchange and thereby in American diplomacy. I firmly believe that international education, research, and capacity building are among our country's most effective diplomatic assets. I've answered each of the committee's questions in detail in my written statement and two appendices, but will summarize the key points for you now. First, the Wild Cornell Medical College in Doha, Qatar, is the first American medical school to offer an MD overseas. In 2001, we were invited to establish this campus by the government of Qatar through the Qatar Foundation for Education Science and Community Development in Education City, which also houses campuses of Virginia Commonwealth University, Georgetown University, Texas A&M University, and Carnegie Mellon University. As with all of our long-term academic alliances with international entities, we ask ourselves two key questions. One, what makes the relationship worth pursuing? And two, what will make the relationship work? The guiding principle is always twofold. The benefits must be compelling, and the risks must be manageable. And we've made public in the appendix to my comments the exact check sheet that we have used in negotiating and considering other branch campus or joint degree activities. Cornell saw the Cutter Foundation's invitation as an opportunity for students from the Middle East to obtain a quality medical education in their own region to improve the quality of health care in that region. In addition, we saw an unprecedented opportunity for our faculty to teach and understand another culture and to broaden their research to investigate the unique medical problems of the region. The Cutter Foundation assumes all the expenses of the building operating the school, and we estimate that to be $750 million over the first decade of operation. We are looking forward to awarding the first medical degrees in Doha in the spring of 2008, and we will be carefully monitoring the success of the degree candidates on standardized tests and on employment placements as two measures to gauge the rigor of the program. Second question, it is not clear what the effect of our branch campuses will be on the global science and technology enterprise, as Mr. Hall mentioned. It is still too early and too many variables. But while globalization may be a new concept in the public rhetoric, Cornell and these schools have a long history of internationalization, in our case going back to our first international students in 1868, and now involving all of our colleges and professional schools and nearly every program on campus. Based on this long experience, we know that any cooperation across borders can play an important role in promoting cross-cultural understanding, 
and that real and substantial benefits accrue to the U.S. and to the process of innovation, the driver of our global economic competitiveness. Third question, much of what we do as a university is, of course, aimed at ensuring the success of our graduates. In this regard, we are responding to the demands of our students in STEM fields for instruction in critical needs languages, such as Arabic, Mandarin, Russian, Hindi, and Farsi, which are among the more than 40 languages taught at Cornell. We encourage students to study abroad, and we have created internationally focused undergraduate programs, such as a new major in China and Asia Pacific Studies, which is designed to train leaders equipped to negotiate the delicate complexities of U.S.-China operations. Just as important as sending students overseas, Cornell welcomes thousands of international students each year. These students contribute to the diversity of the campus, to the community, and to the education of all students. Our international graduates who stay in this country, especially in science and engineering fields, help fill a crying need for scientific and technical talent not currently being filled by American students. Those who return home often maintain contact with Cornell or other American colleagues, laying the foundation for continuing collaboration. In addition, our many international collaborations help prepare Cornell students for a place in the global economy by addressing problems and issues in which both societies have a stake. I want to make the committee aware that in keeping with the conversation with India's Prime Minister in January, Cornell will be working with other U.S. universities and Indian counterpart institutions to create a faculty-led Indo-U.S. working group to develop joint research agendas on critical challenges of interest to both nations. In concluding my remarks, I want you to consider, please, the concept of universities as the catalyst for capacity building in the developing world. The initiatives aimed at strengthening competitiveness and education in STEM disciplines, both from this committee's leadership and from the administration, are pointing us as a nation in the right direction. But just as you are right to be concerned about the U.S. losing ground potentially to China and India, we must also be concerned about the socioeconomic inequalities that threaten our country and our world. Universities are perfectly positioned to play a central role, like the Marshall Plan did 60 years ago in Europe through aid and joint planning, the nation's great research universities, working with governments, the private sector, NGOs, and our colleagues overseas, can offer a more focused application of our own resources to improve the quality of life here and abroad. Chairman Baird, thank you again for inviting me to participate. I'm pleased to answer any questions the committee may have. Chairman Baird, Ranking Member Hall, <coughs> members of the House Committee on Science and Technology. I am the Provost of Georgia Institute of Technology, and I am honored to speak about Georgia Tech's overseas programs. Georgia Tech's international activities fall under the rubric of its mission, which is to define the technological research university of the 21st century and educate the leaders of a technology-driven world. Recognizing that innovation increasingly happens all around the globe, we are developing mutually beneficial research and education platforms overseas with high-quality international partners whose research and educational interests align with ours. In selecting the locations and partners for these platforms, Georgia Tech observes a number of core principles. Platforms are chosen to provide a strategic advantage for Georgia Tech, and they have a research-driven motive and a clear educational benefit for our own students. They operate within the parameters of the laws of the United States and Georgia, as well as of the host nation. The activities must preserve the quality and integrity of Georgia Tech's reputation. Finally, we strive to operate them in a self-supporting and revenue-neutral manner relative to our other operations. Our oldest and largest international campus is Georgia Tech Lorraine in Metz, France, which was founded in 1990 and includes research as well as graduate and undergraduate education programs. A unique research unit joint between Georgia Tech Lorraine and the French National Center for Scientific Research, which is the largest and most influential research agency in Europe, 
allows us to collaborate with French researchers and gives us early access to technology being developed in France. As an example, because France has a high level expertise in aspects of network security, we stand to gain from what we can learn <clears throat> from this partner partnership to benefit the state of Georgia and the United States. Similarly, Singapore, where Georgia Tech also has a research and education program, is more advanced in some aspects of transportation logistics than the United States is, and we can benefit from our partnership there. This program includes research and logistics funded by the Singapore government agencies and their first master's degree in the region in logistics and supply chain management. In addition to the unique partnership, the unique research opportunities provided through our foreign partnerships, our students also benefit from these relationships. As one of the nation's top 10 public universities and its largest producer of engineers, we focus on educating graduates who understand technology in a global context. The nature of science and engineering curricula make study abroad difficult to accommodate, but our international platforms help us offer a wide array of opportunities. More than a third of our undergraduates study or work abroad. 17 of our undergraduate degree programs offer an international designator. This means special courses and overseas experience add a global context to their field of study and that fact is noted on their diplomas. Our graduates are highly sought after by employers and our alumni report that the international aspects of their education add value to their career. Georgia Tech also works closely with the state of Georgia in economic development and our international programs provide a point of access for the state to develop international trade and investment relationships. For example, in 2005, the President of Lorraine and the Governor of Georgia signed a formal agreement under which Georgia Tech Lorraine will serve as a facilitator for business-to-business -business contacts. Georgia Tech's international activities have also attracted foreign corporate research labs to Atlanta to locate adjacent to our campus. In summary, our international platforms enable Georgia Tech to be a partner and collaborator in research discoveries happening in other parts of the world and make our faculty and students citizens of the world. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before the committee. I would be happy to answer any questions. Dr. Schuster, thanks for your remarks. You'll, you'll recognize, of course, you've been joined by a fellow Georgian uh, on the day is here, uh, Dr. Phil Gingrey. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Uh, Mr. Russell, thank you. Chairman Baird, Ranking Member Hall, members of the committee, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to submit my thoughts on the topic of the university role in the globalization of innovation, research, education, and development. It's a consuming issue for almost every major American university campus today. Uh, one might legitimately wonder why a dean of a policy school is testifying before a committee on science and technology. Uh, I guess I have two answers to that question. One is at Carnegie Mellon, we think of policy as a science as well as an art. But the other is uh, we also probably half of what we do at the Heinz School involves information technology management, both in our research and education programs. And it is these programs uh, more than any other that we have that are driving uh, our globalization efforts at the Heinz School. But this globalization, uh, while I believe it to be a tremendously beneficial uh, impact for our institutions and for uh, the United States economy, it cha does challenge us to answer critical questions about the impact of our efforts uh, on the American economy, the effect on the generation of new technology and innovation for our citizens, and our obligations as institutions to people, cultures, societies, and economic systems beyond our borders. What's new generally, in my opinion, about uh, what is happening is that American universities have, while they've always had a strong international connection among faculty for research and in our student body, today universities are engaging the issue of becoming global institutions as part of our overall strategies. There are many forces driving this, but I see three primary forces. One is, of course, the increasing globalization of economic and, and policy activity around the world. The second is that the American tertiary education system is, has been globally recognized as a driver of economic success 
and increasingly governments and businesses are coming to us from around the world to access that expertise. And finally, there are clearly competitive forces in our industry which increasingly require us to be entrepreneurial to, to support the kind of quality and research and education which has been our, our hallmark for decades. Beyond these general forces, what any university or college chooses to do on this front is a manifestation of that institution's particular circumstances, capabilities, and values. My university has made great strides in becoming a global institution. In 1997, other than study abroad programs, we offered only one academic program outside the United States. Today we offer 12 different degree programs in 10 countries and have institution building, joint degree program, and formal collaborative research activities in Singapore, Taiwan, India, China, and Portugal. Additionally, we have official presences which can be characterized as branch campuses in Greece, Qatar, Japan, and Australia. And that list is growing and I expect it to grow in the future. It's important then to point out that there's no single model that's optimal as an instrument to achieve our goals. We evaluate every global opportunity according to its ability to support us in achieving the following objectives. Building alignment with the important organizations and individuals who are leaders in the global economy and policy environment. Reaching new student markets that are unlikely to access our education by coming to Pittsburgh. Create opportunities for our existing students to expand their professional education through integrated professional experiences abroad. Improve our curriculum by broadening our exposure to global policy and business issues. Build a globally aware faculty with an institutional environment capable of supporting intellectual inquiry into the emerging issues posed by globalization. And finally, to create new sources of revenue that can support our activities both abroad and at home. You've rightly asked what outcomes we expect from our efforts to become global institutions. This is, this is a new activity and a bold activity for institutions like mine. Nevertheless, we have some expectations. We expect increased recognition around the world of the potential constructive impact of our institution on the efforts of societies to fulfill the aspirations of their people and a consequent increase in our brand equity. We expect increased financial support for our efforts from both public and private sector entities that are convinced of this value. We expect the ability to deliver education to highly qualified students whom we would not have been able to serve previously. We expect improved quality of education for all of our students as we modify our curricula to reflect what we learn in partnerships around the world and provide opportunities for true professional development in these contexts. We expect better research and innovation outcomes as we expand our reach to include new intellectuals from around the globe. And we expect the ability to experiment with and learn from new models and modes for research and education in a highly decentralized and distributed environment. I'd now like to briefly take a moment to address an important issue which I know has been of concern to the committee. As universities become more global, we are effectively, if unintentionally, increasing the capacity of firms and individuals abroad to do jobs currently done here in the United States. That's an arguable point, but it's my opinion that although this effect is likely to be quite small, it deserves an honest answer, and that honest answer is that it probably is so. Nevertheless, I think that it is also my opinion that in aggregate, the benefits to the U.S. economy and to American workers from our activity far exceeds the cost. Ultimately, our global efforts will create jobs in the United States through improved education and innovation in our institutions. Without taking too much time, I believe the benefits will come in four primary forms. More innovation as a result of our ability to build more vibrant networks of intellectuals drawing on high human capital individuals around the globe. Graduates who are better trained to lead innovation in global business and policy enterprises of the future. More resources generated through our international efforts to support our institutions as a whole. And better, more outward looking universities that are more connected to business and society and have a greater ability to transfer knowledge outside their walls. In my view, this globalization effort is simply a part of a broader movement in academia to reach out and become more engaged with companies, governments, and societies and to be more directly concerned about the responsiveness of our efforts to the needs of society. As evidence of this, Carnegie Mellon has not only gone abroad, it's gone to the West Coast. We, we now have a West Coast campus in the Bay Area that responds to that, that area's technology uh, hotbed there. And my school, the Heinz School, has a new campus in Los Angeles to respond to the film industry, and we'll have, oh, be opening a campus in Washington, D.C within a year to be more tied to our national policy mechanism. 
perhaps I persuaded you, but perhaps not. But one thing I would like to say in closing is that Chairman Baird mentioned the, uh, the Economist report that had 17 of the top 20 global universities coming from the United States. But we're not immune to competition. If we ask what happens if we don't do this, I think the answer for us as institutions is actually quite grim. In 20 years, if we do not assiduously pursue globalization, I think you can easily expect half of the institutions that we see today in the top 20 to drop out. This would ultimately provide serious damage both to the U.S. economy and to the U.S. political system. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Baird, Ranking Member Hall, and colleagues, uh, my role this morning is to provide a, uh, a bit of broader perspective. I, I'm not here to talk about the uh, uh, efforts of uh, my own university in, in uh, internationalization, but to provide a broad perspective on what I think some of the key issues uh, are. Uh, as my colleagues have said, uh, the, the, the future of universities, of excellent universities around the world is a global future. There is no question about that. And if we as institutions and if we as states and the nation don't take this seriously, we are going to fail in the future. So that's key. We need to be globally competitive in higher education. Universities have always been international, indeed global, uh, institutions. From the medieval universities, which used, we should remember, a common uh, language of instruction, Latin, uh, and which attracted foreign students and faculty. They didn't call them that in those days. Um, uh, they were truly global uh, in, uh, in, in institutions. The United States, in fact, if you look at our higher education system, we have imported models from all around the world. Uh, our uh, university system is based really on three ideas. Uh, the British Colonial College, uh, the German Research University of the 19th century, and the truly American idea of uh, uh, uni uh, university service to society. Those are the three key elements that have shaped American higher education. And I should say, shape the world's higher education today, because the American university is the global model. If you look around the world, and we all see every day, not every day, but frequently, uh, colleagues from different countries uh, are coming to our universities and finding out how we do it, because we, in our higher education industry, are the gold standard uh, today. So that's very important. A few definitions which I think are important, because we bandy about globalization, internationalization, and so on, and we often don't define them uh, carefully. What I mean, and what many, many scholars have talked about globalization to mean, are the broad uh, economic and social uh, trends that affect the world environment, including, of course, information technology, the growing role and use of the English language, which I think gives us in the U.S. a very significant advantage internationally in, uh, in higher education, worldwide demand for access, and so on. These are factors over which we have little control and which are part of the broader environment. What I mean by internationalization, and my colleagues have talked about aspects of this this morning, uh, are the specific policies of governments, universities, schools, colleges, and even people uh, to adapt, define, and contribute to this global environment. Academic institutions, as well as states and nations, have different ideas about adapting to the global environment. And I would say, as a comparative educator, that if you look around the world, our major com national competitors deeply engaged in an academic foreign policy are ahead of us in the U.S. in terms of thinking about their approaches, national approaches to higher education, uh, exports to higher education policy in a global environment. What's meant by multinationalization, and here is where branch campuses uh, uh, come in, multinationalization encompasses academic programs and institutions, including the branch campuses, that are offered by academic institutions in one country in another. Uh, some people have called this McDonaldization, and part of it is franchising in truly McDonald's fashion. Now, that's not what the universities represented at this table do, but there is some of that around the world, and it's important to watch because 
all of the global trends the international trends are not of tremendously uh, high quality uh, today let me mention a few things a few kind of uh, uh, one particular case study that I know is of interest uh, to this committee and that's the interesting issue of branch campuses uh, there are, according to the rather incomplete research, at least 82 branch campuses that operate uh, today uh, around, around the world, and the number is probably significantly uh, higher than that. Uh, the United States is the largest single country uh, that contributes to the branch campus uh, phenomenon, with approximately half. Branch campuses are largely a north to south phenomenon, that is, universities in rich countries are opening branch camp campuses in developing or middle-income uh, countries. Most branch campuses worldwide, with very few exceptions, uh, operate in English overseas, even from countries like the Netherlands, which is not an English-speaking country. Their branch campuses uh, operate largely in English. With the opening of China and India, uh, both highly complicated regulatory environments today, uh, the branch campus phenomenon is likely to become even more important. What are the motivations, very briefly, uh, to senders? To earn money, that's part of it. To build a brand image overseas, to help to recruit uh, students uh, from other countries to come to the home campus, to provide a destination for study abroad for, uh, for our own uh, uh, students, and broadly as part of an, international, an internationalization strategy. And finally, uh, a couple of problems. Uh, the failure to earn money is a problem. Uh, the University of New South Wales in Australia uh, just recently closed its branch campus in Singapore uh, after, the, uh, after less than a year, uh, and, and the expenditure of a very large, of money, uh, large amount of Australian money and, by the way, Singapore money, too, because enrollments were, were not what they uh, wanted. The failure to maintain the standards of the home campus abroad. Again, the institutions at this table would not be part of that phenomenon, but it's there. It's important. How do we get our own faculty to go abroad to, uh, to, to, to teach for periods uh, of, of, of time? Um, difficulties of dealing with uh, host governments and institutions. Regulatory environments overseas are quite difficult. Managing quality control at this, at this end of things through our accrediting system, which is used and very effective in contributing to quality assessment and control within the United States is less able to do that abroad. Well, these are some of the issues, and I hope I've provided at least a little bit of perspective uh, to get our discussion going uh, here this morning. Thank you. I really th thank all the witnesses for just fascinating and stimulating discussion on a very intriguing topic. Uh, uh, Dr. Scor and I especially uh, share your commitment to role of universities in the academic environment to international collaboration and understanding. You know, we one of my goals as chair of the subcommittee on research and education is the concept of science diplomacy, finding ways where we can bridge gaps that may emerge in politics, religion, culture, etc. And the science and, and academic endeavor can bring people together. Uh, Dr. Schuster, I, I also appreciate very much your insights. We tend to look at this as, oh my goodness, American universities are giving something valuable that is uniquely American away to the other countries. I think you pointed out well that there are many countries that actually do things better than us and we can learn from our presence there and that thereby benefits us because uh, we're not just giving our vast superior knowledge in every universal field away. We actually can go to places where they're ahead of us, which we tend to forget sometimes here. Uh, Mr. Vessel, uh, I appreciated your comment. The policy is, uh, is, is both science and art. Hang around here long enough, you'll learn it's more artifact than art. <laughs> uh, and uh, Dr. Altbach, uh, the historical insights are well taken. Uh, this is indeed not necessarily a, an immediately new phenomenon. Um, one of the questions I have uh, is I have come to uh, appreciate the incredible value that has, has derived to our society from foreign students who have come here and gained their, their undergraduate or graduate degrees and then go back to home country with not only knowledge that they serve their own country with, but in many, in most cases, I think a deep affection for our country. 
as we establish branch campuses overseas, will we see a, a decline in the number of foreign students who come here and hence a potential indirect decline in that kind of emotional tie to, to, to the, 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 our own nation that carries all sorts of benefits? Any, any thoughts on that? Let me answer first, and that's something that uh, is of interest and a little bit of concern to us as well at Georgia Tech. In the programs that we're establishing abroad, particularly the graduate programs at the master's and the Ph.D. level, a part of the curriculum expects those students to spend a semester or a year on the Atlanta campus uh, for exactly the purpose that you identified, is to give them an experience of the American Research University in and we believe that that will strengthen the ties and expand our ability to build relationships and use science as diplomacy uh, around the world. I agree with Dr. Schuster. It's hard to say at this stage. But uh, the early evidence that we have is actually quite promising on this. We opened a, a campus in uh, Kobe, Japan uh, about two years ago. And I've seen at my school applications from Japanese uh, uh, government officials and uh, private sector folks actually increase as a result of the increased visibility that we have. We never had Australian students at our campus and because we've developed uh, our campus in Pittsburgh and because we've developed a, an integrated curriculum across our two campuses, we now have students going back and forth between those two campuses and we have Australian students in Pittsburgh and U.S. students studying, taking part of their uh, studies in, abroad. So uh, I actually am cautiously optimistic about the impact on this in our home camp. Uh, actually, I'm highly optimistic that there will not be a decline in international student numbers coming to the U.S. If you look at the projections uh, in the out years, uh, the, the demand for international higher education, be it from students who uh, want to go to a different country, and there are many motivations for people who want to go to different countries, including immigration, which is going to continue, um, uh, um, uh, those numbers seem to be uh, quite significant. So I think the establishment of uh, branch campuses of American universities overseas will not affect overall student numbers coming here and may, as my colleagues have said, actually uh, Im improve the quality of students coming to this country because they'll know better what they're getting into and have an exposure already to, to, to U.S. higher education. Uh, I might point out one other thing slightly related to your question, uh, and, and that is uh, if you look at student number, uh, overseas student uh, enrollments over a long period of time in the U.S., um, uh, you'll find that uh, very significant numbers have not gone home, uh, and that has benefits to our country, and of course, you know, um, uh, American uh, policymakers have been concerned about maintaining in some ways the, the numbers from overseas who contribute to s and in this uh, country. Uh, but the, the big sending countries, uh, India and China, over time, 75% uh, or so of their graduates, this is over 20 years, uh, have remained uh, in the United States after their graduation. So this is a very significant number. Um, and we need to examine what this means for our economy, of course, what it means for their economies as, uh, as well. And one final little point, uh, that is, uh, to me, the big determinant on numbers of foreign students uh, is not branch campuses. It's U.S. policy welcoming, making possible for international students to come to this country, visa restrictions and all that stuff that you're well aware of. Thank you. Um, as, uh, as Yogi Berra has said, uh, or is attributed to him, it's hard to predict, especially about the future. And um, uh, I agree with my colleagues in terms of the, uh, we're about all of the same generation in terms of how we grew up in higher education. Um, I want to sound a slightly dissonant note, though, with my colleagues. Um, I think that uh, thinking about American higher education as an economic sector, just for a moment, we consider it a calling, of course, but it's also a business, an economic sector. Um, I'm not complacent about our ability to continue to compete in the world. These are selective schools you see in front of you who get many more applications than we can accept students, both domestic and international. Overall, we have very, very serious competition from international institutions in the developed world, in Australia, the UK, Europe, and elsewhere. 
and a rising tide of com competition coming from uh, China and India. Um, the Indian government has been advised to quadruple the number of universities in India over the next 15 years, quadruple. And the population changes, the foreign competition, and other matters may make the answer to this question different 10 years from now um, than it is now. I'm not sure what the effect will be. Um, there are two other factors. One, to repeat what Dr. Altbach said, the um, ease or lack of ease of getting in the country, staying in the country, leaving the country on a brief visit is a very, very tough, sweet spot to find. We're all concerned about this on this panel. We're also very concerned about national security. And secondly, I think a, a very, very important uh, final comment is that the um, ability of um, our universities to offer something uh, uh, unique and different at a cost that people can't afford is another factor. Uh, and I would only speak for my own university and the private universities in the country. It's a very expensive proposition. And the uh, ability of international students uh, to find resources to meet those financial obligations are also a big challenge. So in summary, I agree that right now uh, we're not concerned that the branch campuses will directly impact our ability to share the American experience with people from overseas. But I think in the long run, we cannot be complacent about this aspect of the American economy either. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Scarden, your testimony argues that the U.S. needs to continue attracting, quote, the best and brightest students, staff, and faculty members to remain competitive. And in addition, uh, you argue that we ought to invest in teaching and research abroad to, quote, spur economic growth. Are these two goals on the same level, uh, mutually exclusive, and how can we provide both equal educational opportunities abroad uh, if we are seeking the benefits here? Uh, Mr. Hall, this is a $64,000 question. It's a balancing act that we have to uh, deal with in this country. Um, I call your attention uh, to um, uh, work by the Business Higher Education Forum over the last few years, including a congressional hearing about five weeks ago about the um, uh, crisis in the pipeline for STEM graduates in the United States. And uh, not to take up more than my time, but I'm glad later to give to the committee staff uh, abundant data from the Business Higher Education Forum and other sources that shows the tremendous work that we have to do to maintain a robust pipeline of teachers and students in STEM disciplines in this country. So I want to say, and I want to make this point very strongly, we do need the best and the brightest from overseas. Uh, depending on the American university that one talks about and looks into, perhaps as much as 50% of the graduate student population in some mathematical, physical, science, and engineering disciplines, and perhaps as much as 30% of the graduate student population in some life science disciplines are international in focus. So I need, and I would uh, hasten to say we need, the brightest international students for our programs. By the same token, uh, these cliches about the world being flat and so on are, are actually true. And just as multinational corporations do everything from R&D to marketing to product development around the world, so innovation is an international phenomenon. And so in fact, I don't really see them as mutually exclusive. The question will be as we build up the strength overseas, Will we bump into each other going in the door? That's what you're asking me. Right now, the answer is no. Make no mistake about it. We accrue the main benefit in this country of international collaborations. But we have to keep an eye on it, and we do not collect data as robustly and crisply as to answer many of the questions that you've raised. And the, the cost uh, of, and the other question by the chairman here, uh, are the costs equivalent to the U.S. Uh, campus cost uh, for an attendee? Are they equivalent to our cost here that you charge them to attend? Uh, I, I wouldn't want to speak broadly about all branch campuses, but uh, we are, uh, uh, I believe it was um, uh, Dr. Schuster who used the word revenue neutral, and the idea would be whatever the costs are, and they're going to depend on the sort of operation that it is, it will cost a different kind of expense to train a physician or an engineer than it will uh, cost uh, to train uh, someone in a humanities discipline or a social science discipline. But I think in general, we have to operate uh, under the idea that it will be revenue neutral. 
And so overall, whatever the cost of education is, we have to find a way to retire that. Uh, I, I know you know this, Mr. Hall. I just want to remind you that uh, the cost of uh, paying for higher education in this country is a complicated, crazy quilt of the tuition paid, which does not cover all the cost, philanthropy, enormous public investment, at Cornell, a private university, we get nearly a billion dollars of public money a year in the form of research grants, student aid, money from the state of New York. And so this combination of uh, tuition, grants and contracts, philanthropy and other, other uh, procedures all have to add up to a nonprofit bottom line. So in general, the costs have to be borne, but the various weighting of those factors, how much will be from the different factors in different campuses will depend on the discipline, the costs and the overall capability of the institution. I keep uh, reading and hearing the media keeps shouting back at us the uh, escalating cost of, of sending your youngster to school and how we better be saving for, you know, that one that's in the fourth or fifth grade now and looking ahead for it. Uh, do you ever have any situations where some of us Americans send ours over to your school there and could they attend there? Would that be one way of us cutting down on the escalating cost of uh, graduating from, say, uh, Cornell? I'm going to give you a firm yes and no answer to that one. Uh, <laughs> yes, it's probably yes. not a fair question. Uh, everything's fair. Uh, uh, yes, uh, certainly uh, American students are eligible to go to many of these uh, campuses, although uh, the idea, of course, is to establish a, a footprint in another society. Um, we do have work to do in higher education on the balance between uh, cost control and funding. And uh, just because I've garnered the floor, and I'll say very quickly in 30 seconds, it's a three-part solution to the problem that you've raised. We need a commitment from you and other members of our elected officials to make sure that public money continues to go to student aid in this country. We cannot fail to do that no matter what other economic challenges we have. Secondly, our own alumni have to help us with philanthropy. And thirdly, I know that I have to do a better job of cost containment going forward. I wouldn't say that about my colleagues, but I know I have to do a better job of cost containment. And in closing, what better way can we spend our money? Uh, and and my last question, and I don't expect an answer from it, is uh, uh, for a state institution overseas, who you consider to be out of state? And I'll, I'll withdraw that, and I'll yield back my time. Mr. Lamson. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hall always comes up with the hardest of the questions. <laughs> uh, I happened to be in a, in a meeting, and I stepped out for a minute. Uh, uh, last week, uh, we were in a hearing, and I saw a group of, of uh, college students sitting in the office talking or listening to the, uh, on the panel. I decided to go out and listen to the kids, uh, and I found it pretty fascinating what, what their insight uh, was and the group of uh, young folks that I met with are now sitting in the back room over there, uh, helping me design a program that will implement what their what their vision is, and hopefully will su will will succeed. It really, is about uh, about the, uh, the students and what what uh, they can get out of that, and what we would like to see happen uh, into uh, into the future, as far as I'm concerned. And I was wondering about uh, because what we see happening uh, with other nations building their own universities. Are there any that have built branches in the United States from their universities that you're aware of? Um, uh, very briefly, there are rumors uh, that a couple of uh, Mexican universities are uh, opening or planning to open branch campuses in Hispanic areas in the United States to serve Spanish-speaking uh, students in the U.S., but those are so far unconfirmed. The short answer to the question is no. Uh, and this is an interesting broader policy issue, actually, because uh, it, in my view, there isn't much potential. In other words, the, the, the higher education environment in the United States is so complex and so, generally speaking, good and so varied across sectors, it would be difficult for an international and foreign institution to come here and make a success of it. Uh, the British Open University actually tried a few years ago with using their brand of distance education to come into the U.S. and failed. Uh, so I, I think broadly the answer is no. I'm hoping that what the example that you said where the rumor was is not an example of, of north-south. Uh, uh, 
that you, that you explained a minute ago. Do you want to make a comment, Mr. Dr. Mr. Wilson? Uh, I, I don't know that they've actually set up branches here, but I know we have a relationship with uh, Tech de Monterey in, in Mexico, and they have very, uh, very assiduously pursued student markets, particularly in the southwest United States, for, for their programs, including in partnership with some uh, U.S. institutions. Um, are you having uh, the kinds of difficulties when students, when it comes to the time that uh, student who is in your branch needs to spend time here on, on your campus here in the United States, how difficult is it for them to receive the visas necessary or the other visiting documents uh, necessary for them to come? Anyone? Dr. <clears throat> Yeah, I can't speak directly to the specific cohort of students who would be coming from branch campuses, but I think everybody at this table, and I suspect that everybody in the room is aware of some of the challenges that higher education has faced in being able to have visas issued in a timely and way to appropriate students and any assistance that you might be provide to us and resolving that problem we would greatly appreciate. Uh, well, I want your comment, but has it have has it had an impact on uh, on the financing of our universities. Uh, if you, both of you may want to comment on it or, or anyone. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Scorton. Um, first of all, uh, uh, I'd like to separate two, two questions. The overall question, as my colleagues have said, about the accessibility of the U.S. to uh, international scholars and students continues to be an area of concern. Um, I wouldn't want to be in your seat trying to decide exactly where to find that sweet spot, but I think the pendulum swung a certain distance uh, before and immediately after 9-11, it swung back. We've had a lot of terrific uh, dialogue from the higher education community with the Department of Homeland Security and with the State Department. I'm honored to be on the National Security Higher Education Advisory Board, which is appointed by the director of the FBI, and there's about 20 university presidents on that board, and the whole point of that was to initiate better dialogue. So I think that things are going in the right direction. The branch campuses are a special case. It's a small number of students relative to the large number of international students who come here, and we have it set up uh, in advance as a prescribed program. So, for example, we have students right now in the summer uh, in Ithaca, New York, and in New York City at the medical school of Cornell, while Cornell Medical College from the medical school and pre-medical program in Qatar, international students, and we have been able to, to do that. So two separate questions. I think focused approaches to programs where it's clear the length of time the student's going to be staying. It's all worked out ahead of time. We've had a lot of cooperation. It's been more manageable. The overall issue of visas and so on, still trying to find what the right balance is, a difficult problem. Uh, talk that China has built a significant number of new universities. Uh, they're attracting a lot of the world's uh, students, uh, Australia, perhaps other countries. Uh, be something for us to worry about? Do you have any comment that, that you advise that we ought to be looking at as a Congress uh, up change any aspect of that? Yes, I can reflect on that. Um, uh, China and India, too, are beginning to have strategies to attract students from other countries to those countries. My own view is that they will not be tremendously successful. Uh, the, Issues of quality of higher education, language questions, um, ease of study, uh, the attractiveness of those cultures, and so on, are such that it will be a bit difficult for them to attract the numbers that they seem to be thinking about. So far, there isn't much going on in that area. But there will be, and we should, we should be careful to monitor it. <coughs> My own view is, so long as U.S. institutions maintain their quality, maintain their uh, 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 attractiveness, and maintain their sort of general um, uh, excellence uh, overall, we will do very well in international competition in higher education. We start with hu a huge advantage. Our issue here is to maintain that advantage. We're at a, we're, we're at a good place if we continue to, to be aware of the issues to support the institutions to provide um, uh, 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 rational access in terms of immigration and, and uh, visas and that sort of thing, we'll do well. I'm pretty optimistic about that. There is a lot of competition out there, 
uh, the Australians, the British, the New Zealanders, they particularly at the present time are the big competition. They're doing pretty well. They have some problems. Australia particularly right now, which I think over-invested and didn't take the care that they needed to in establishing some of their uh, overseas twinning and branch campuses and franchising. So they're, it's coming back to bite them a little bit. But so long as we maintain uh, our excellence uh, and attractiveness, we'll, we'll do fine. I'm going to uh, Thank you, ask, Mr. Uh, Mr. Inglis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, several years ago, we had a exchange student at our house from Turkmenistan. While he was with us, the uh, Turkmen Basi, the guy that ran Turkmenistan, closed all the hospitals in uh, Turkmenistan and said if they are sick, they can come to the capital. And uh, he gives you an idea about where this guy comes from. I said to him, Sardar, how long does it take to get from your town of Mary to the capital? He said, two hours. So it gives you an idea of the conditions maybe in Turkmenistan, that if you're having a heart attack in Mary and you need to get to the capital, it's two hours away. And the last night that he was with us, he came into my little office at our house and he said, sir, I want to come back. He said, it is possible in this country for ordinary people to send their children to college. In my country, it is not possible. So will you help me come back? Of course, it's quite a showstopper for me. Um, last night, I got a call from my wife saying, what are we going to do with Siddhar? Because we just got an email from him saying, will you help me? It cost me $2,600 a year and $150 a month to go to the American University of Central Asia. And uh, we've got five kids, and uh, uh, one's finished college, one's in college, one's going next year. And so my wife says, maybe we can help Sardar. Um, I suppose that Sardar in some ways is somebody that fits some of this. It's a way of offering him an opportunity. Um, is the goal to make it more cost effective for, for him or to expand the reach of your universities or both? I think everybody is moved by the sort of stories that you just related. And uh, the truth is, and I think most of us in this room know that there are thousands and thousands of those stories of uh, qualified, ambitious individuals who are just looking for an opportunity to And part of our motivation is to provide those opportunities around. I want to come back to this question of what is it that attracts foreign students to American universities and what is it that we're trying to propagate by moving some of our operations offshore. And it comes down to two important issues, I believe, quality and culture. And it's been said by my colleagues here, and I thank you very much for the compliments. <coughs> by characterizing American universities as the gold standard or one of the best in the world. And I think th that is certainly true and is well recognized. And the question becomes, of course, well, what is it that drives that? What is it that makes the American universities recognized globally as the leader? And why is it that I think personally that uh, universities established in India, whether they quadruple the number or in China, uh, will not become competitive quickly, and the answer is culture. And I think that the opportunity to succeed in a meritocracy rather than a culture of hierarchy is one of the great strengths of the American university. Uh, it's open. It is a competition of ideas, not of age or of birth or of status or of title. And I think that the examples of history inform us of that. The American universities have been the entry point for American for immigrants to the United States to gain an education and to become successful and leading citizens. And part of our objective in moving offshore is to provide that opportunity for like the one that you described in their home country. And is the, is the challenge with somebody like Sadar is getting the opportunity to come here? I think we can get the visa, right? It's relatively open. Uh, that's my impression. Is that, uh, is, is that correct? So in, in coming here is obviously more expensive than being 
educated at the American University of Central Asia, if, that's, if he's got the price right at $2,600 a year plus $150 a month. Um, but still, that's a large sum of money if you're in Turkmenistan. So I just wanted to make one connection on this issue of students coming here. Uh, uh, one of the real primary reasons students come to universities in America is to access the U.S. labor market. They certainly come for the training that we offer and the skills enhancement, but it is much easier for them to get jobs in U.S. companies through being in school here uh, than uh, if they do their study abroad. One of the problems on the visa side that I see is not so much student visas, although that can be an issue, but the reliability of our system to provide work visas for highly talented foreign nationals actually influences the choices people make when they decide where they're going to come to college. And that's been a much more highly variable uh, phenomenon, particularly over the last few years, and, and I think it's a very difficult question for reasons Dr. Scorton uh, outlined and others. But I think it's a really important one for us to pay attention to. And Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to entertain any offers of grants and aid uh, at this point. Just, just kidding. So, uh, Mr. Inglis, I appreciate it. We're all appreciative of your support for that student. Uh, I want to recognize Ms. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming out here this morning. I know you have busy schedules, and your testimony has been very interesting and enlightening. Uh, Dr. Scorton, have you had, have you found a need to create uh, private institutions or private entities to carry out uh, creating overseas institutions and to operate and own those institutions? Um, you mean entities separate from Cornell University? private institutions that could be associated in some way with Cornell, but yes, separate. No, we haven't been. Um, if you have a chance uh, or your staff to look at a checklist, an appendix that I put in my, my prepared remarks, we've, we've made public exactly what sort of due diligence we do when trying to figure this out. We've been quite open about it. We share it with other universities uh, who have uh, thought about going, for example, into Education City in Doha. We've been able to do that through the normal uh, mechanisms of the corporate structure of Cornell, but there's a lot of detailed due diligence that goes into that, uh, that if, if you have a chance, or I'd be glad to respond, is laid out in that ap appendix. Sure. Uh, now, that we've, now that we're talking about the due diligence, you indicate that there's a, a need to have a compelling, uh, you want a compelling reason to open up uh, an institution. What sort of uh, framework do you use to make that decision that something's compelling or not? Uh, the compelling by, by compelling, I mean that there is a rationale in the local context that is we're filling a need, uh, even if it's a competitive need in the, in the culture or society. So, for example, in the case of the medical school in Qatar, there was a, a perceived need, a perceived market, if I can use that term, for an American medical degree in that part of the world. It's the first co-ed institution in Qatar. And uh, as, as is indicated in the appendix, we have retained the right to utilize non-discrimination policies uh, as we do in the United States and the state of New York to apply to hiring and to uh, admissions decisions um, in, in that culture. So part of it is the, uh, by compelling, I mean that there is a need or market, a niche that looks like it would be important. Uh, another compelling need would be on the research side, as Dr. Schuster has said, uh, and I can't emphasize this more uh, uh, too much, uh, the ability to study certain problems that are best studied in a certain environment or best studied uh, jointly. And so that, that's what I meant by the, uh, by the idea of compelling. Thank you, Dr. Scorton. Yes, Dr. Schuster. Let me uh, add to and amplify what Dr. Scorton has said. Uh, one of the first criteria is that we be invited. Uh, we want to be wanted by the government, by the, uh, the structure that asks us to be a partner, a participant in the foreign country in which we plan to operate. And so we don't want to look as though we're colonists or invaders. We want to be invited in. Uh, another criterion is that we want to make sure that we set up an operating environment and an operating structure in which we can maintain our quality and our ethics. As Dr. Scorton said, uh, we will not operate in a way which will violate our principles. Uh, quite important is the opportunity to take advantage of unique 
uh, resources or challenges within a country. And so, for example, I suspect you're all aware of the challenges associated with water quality and water distribution. Uh, we have faculty working in Africa and Central Africa on water distribution, advising governments, advising governments in the Middle East on water quality and water distribution opportunities. And uh, that turns into uh, opportunities for our faculty members to participate in the solution of some of the most challenging problems the world faces. So, well, so a human, humanitarian uh, uh, aspect to this, to this decision making as well then, it sounds like. It, it's one of the components, sir, in which we weigh the opportunities. Uh, I think that many of us at this table, I suspect all of us, the, us at this table will tell you that rarely does a week or a month go by where we don't get an inquiry from some entity in a foreign government asking for a partnership at some level. And uh, I like the phrase uh, that uh, Dr. Altbach used, McDonaldization. <laughs> That's not a, a role that we want to participate in. Dr. Altbach, uh, I wanted to ask you this. Uh, you mentioned regulation several times. Uh, could you elaborate on what that means, or is that too specific to the country that you're, that you're locating in? Uh, yes, it's specific to the countries in which you're locating. Um, uh, each country has a different regulatory environment, or in some cases, no regulatory environment, or in other cases, they're thinking it through, and it becomes very complicated for U.S. or other foreign institutions which are thinking of locating a branch campus in any given country. I India is a prime example right now. They're thinking through uh, how they want to regulate, how they want to recognize, how they want to permit uh, foreign academic institutions coming in to the country. Uh, China for a long time has had the policy of insisting, and I think it's not a bad policy actually, insisting that uh, foreign institutions that wish to come into China must partner with a local uh, Chinese institution. They can't do it on their own. And they're thinking of changing that so as to make it possible for freestanding branches to come in. But the point of my comment is that there's a range of uh, uh, different uh, regulatory environments that are changing. Uh, some of them are not exactly uncorrupt. Uh, and institutions which are thinking of going into a country need to be concerned about these matters. If I can make a couple of other reactions to points that have been... I'm going to ask you to re refrain, Dr. Okay. Alpach, if, if the opportunity arises in a second. I just were over uh, sure. McNerney's time, and I want to give time to all the panelists <laughs> today. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And uh, the chairman whispered in my ear when I came to the ranking member's seat, and he said, you're not going to try to out anecdote Mr. Hall, are you? <laughs> I was a little surprised when I told him I did have, a, have an anecdote. Uh, it's about Dr. Schuster. Uh, in fact, Dr. Schuster, I was reading in your bio, and I want to share this with everybody that's in the room, that Dr. Schuster has uh, published more than 230 papers in peer-reviewed scientific journals on many topics. But one of his best-known discoveries is called Chemically Initiated Electron Exchange Luminescence. It provides a mechanistic basis that allows the understanding of the bioluminescence of the North American firefly. This discovery forms the basis for new clinical diagnostic procedures that have recently been commercialized. Well, I want to, here's the anecdote. Dr. Schuster, when I was uh, 12 years old, uh, I had a great idea. I, uh, we were, it was during the summertime, and my cousin and I were catching these fireflies. We call them lightning bugs. And my parents were going out that evening with his parents to dinner, and I knew when they got back, they would enjoy a cocktail before going to bed. So me and my cousin decided that we would try to freeze these lightning bugs and put them in an ice tray. And our idea was, of course, to freeze them in the luminescent phase, and what a surprise that would be when they went to mix their drinks later on that night. <laughs> Unfortunately, all these fireflies uh, went dark, and they were just dead bugs inside these ice cubes. <laughs> now, fortunately, I slept through that spanking. <laughs> but uh, I would just like to say that I think if, the, if you've cashed in on this, I'd like you to share some of those royalties with me because uh, uh, <laughs> that is the anecdote. Now, I do, I do have a serious question, though, and this is a very, a very serious, uh, serious hearing. And uh, 
I uh, promised the witnesses this would be an erudite panel here today. <laughs> <laughs> well, we wanted to put a, lighten it up a little bit, Mr. Chairman. No pun intended, of course. Uh, but, but really, the the question is, uh, and and of course, Dr. Albeck, I think, uh, pointed to it when he said that 75% uh, of the graduates, uh, foreign nationals, that come here uh, on student visas uh, in graduate programs, masters or PhD programs, have remained in the country after they have completed their studies. And and you know this is there's good and bad in 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 that in uh, in my concern and we've discussed this with other panels before this committee and certainly when I was on the education uh, committee in a previous Congress we we talked about it and were dealing with the higher ed sections uh, the the brain drain and the fact that you know they they come and they stay and they compete and maybe they're possibly paid a little bit less it's a disincentive I'm I'm afraid to some of our uh, best and brightest in this country to pr pr proceed STEM education, uh, maybe even when they need to be thinking about it at the middle and high school level because, gee, you know, lawyers and doctors and uh, certainly not politicians uh, make more money than engineers and, and pure scientists and chemists and biochemists. And uh, I would like any and all of the witnesses uh, in the time remaining uh, I took too long for the anecdote, but if you can uh, respond to that, because it is a concern. Since I made the initial uh, comment, first of all, it's, uh, I was talking about China and India specifically. Uh, it's not true overall. Uh, uh, some, many other countries have significantly higher rates of return, even developing countries, um, of students who get their degrees here and do go back. Um, I don't like to refer to any more to what used to be called the brain drain because I think the, the, the situation now in the era of globalization, uh, and I'll try to be really brief because this is a really big issue, um, uh, it is now much more complicated. And uh, individuals who stay in the United States, uh, especially from rapidly developing uh, uh, countries, uh, increasingly have important relationships back home. Uh, and that benefits their economy and it benefits our economy and it greatly benefits them. Uh, there's much more going, going back and forth. So to be brief, um, although the, the stay rate is declining modestly, more are going home as there are opportunities in their home countries. But even those who remain are much more engaged in the global, uh, the global economy, and that benefits us and it benefits them. I, I agree with that. I would also say as pieces of evidence uh, from our experience, and this relates to our graduate programs in information technology management, uh, there's no evidence that uh, our international student graduates earn less money when they graduate than our domestic student graduates, that they uh, are treated quite uh, quite similarly on that on that um, scale. And we go out of our way, including ad additional financial support, to try and attract qualified U.S. citizens to these programs. And it is a serious, serious challenge. Uh, and that, that despite the fact that we fund them more generously than we would on average an international student of the same caliber. It's a, it's a real challenge for us. Very excellent question and a and delightful anecdote as well. Uh, Mr. Mitchell. Well. well, since we seem to be in the anecdote business today, let me um, jump in with one of mine. I don't know if this story is really true or not, but uh, uh, it is a story that uh, Chinese kids are told, and I suppose there is a point to it. Um, the story is that uh, silk technology uh, left China uh, because of, uh, uh, depending on your point of view, uh, a courageous or a treacherous uh, Chinese princess who uh, carried the silk cocoons, the silkworm in their cocoons uh, in, um, I don't know, a bouffant hairdo or something like that. And she snuck the cocoons in there and carried them down the silk road 
uh, enabling uh, other countries to start uh, comp a competing silk industry. And uh, the reason why she so carefully hid those cocoons is because, uh, so Chinese children are told, uh, there was a death penalty imposed for exporting silk technology uh, from China. Now, whether that's true or not, I thought I'd just share that story with you all as you consider exporting American know-how to other countries. Um, the world has progressed in many respects, but some of the old lessons, um, well, they are old lessons because there may be a grain of wisdom or not, as the case may be. And I just offer up that story. Well, the story kind of speaks for itself. Um, before you all raise your hands to comment, uh, I want to pitch uh, something else to you all, um, which is um, a way to enhance student financial aid at no cost to the taxpayer, um, and which is uh, tied to uh, bringing additionally qualified folks to the United States. Um, Chris Cox and I proposed this in 1999, and we almost got it passed, but uh, we, got, uh, we got caught in a three-way squeeze at the plate, and uh, uh, it didn't quite pass. But uh, we're running back up the flagpole and just wanted you all to be aware of it. Uh, the proposal is to grant an additional quantum of H-1B visas. And as you all know, um, businesses are petitioned for the visas on behalf of a beneficiary. The petitioner would be required to make a payment uh, to an accredited college or university in the amount of the then existing Pell Grant. Let's just call that today $5,000. As you know, um, petitioners today, recruiters, uh, pay $100,000, $200,000 to bring an employee in, uh, in a, a quali to find a qualified employee, pay the moving costs and all the other associated costs. So, so $5,000 a year is, on a comparative basis, uh, chump change. And um, every high-tech operating executive I know is strongly in favor of this proposal. Their lobbyists here in Washington sometimes sing a slightly different tune. Uh, the, the, the way that this would work is that they would come to qualified universities, lay down their $5,000, you would certify that they had done so, and uh, the immigration authorities would be, uh, give expedited processing uh, to, their, uh, uh, to their visa petition. And, um, in this case, expedited processing would probably work because most of the time uh, the folks that they are looking for are already at your institutions and all the pre-clearances could have been done uh, well in advance. Um, I continue to think that this is a good idea um, and uh, uh, we are going to pitch it up as part of a broader immigration package and um, I've brought this to the attention of various uh, educators and high-tech folks uh, back in 1999 and 2000, and the education community was very, very enthusiastic. Uh, the high-tech community at the operational level was very enthusiastic. Um, at the lobbying level back in 1999, they called that uh, an additional tax. Um, we responded that it was not a tax, it was a voluntary payment. Um, they seem to have come around because uh, in 2007, no one's saying the T word anymore, but they do want a credit for prior donations made. And our response has been, well, actually, we'd like to see fresh cash on the barrel head because we want to see that for college financial aid. And by the way, uh, we, the, 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 the legislation as drafted would require you all to pass that on dollar for dollar through uh, to uh, American students. And just want to make you all aware of that. 
um, uh, while not giving up my place in the queue in the anecdote business either. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back to balance my time. Mr. Rohrbacher. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First, I'd like to mention to know that uh, Cornell University is a SIBO uh, telescope project in Puerto Rico. I can give a good example of the type of uh, positive impact that our major universities can have in practical terms. I hope I would alert the rest of our committee to the uh, Light of that project uh, funding, and I believe that work, work with you uh, keep that project live. That's the good part of my question. <laughs> now the other shoe is going to drop in a minute here. Uh, I'll have to tell you, Mr. Chairman, I I find a lot of talk about globalization shade and. I'm going to have to tell you the testimony today hasn't uh, changed my opinion of that. As for major university, frankly, I didn't find remarks at all about global. Let me tell you, the people of the United States pay for our universities. This is not a public service to foreigners. Billions of dollars spent for higher education by the American people are meant first and foremost to educate our young people, provide skills for American young people, should have no uh, uh, apologies to make about the uh, sort of glancing over the negative impact happening in some areas in terms of having foreign students. The about uh, we live in the global world now this doesn't cut it with me. And uh, but let me ask you this. First of all, before I, so as I get into the, the, last, the last question, which focus, what are these foreign students studying? Are they not many of these students from China, for example, uh, being trained to take billion, uh, basically information and research information back? which we have spent billions of dollars to develop in the United States, are we not then putting this into their human, this human computer so they can go home and uh, utilize that in some cases in their military in order to put the United States in, a, in jeopardy? Is this not something that we should be concerned about? Because what I understand is many of these foreign students at the graduate level are taking the hard sciences, sciences, which permit them then the information that can help with their military and their war industries. Please go right ahead. First of all, Mr. Roebuck, I want to thank you for bringing up RSCBO, and I very much appreciate your support of that project. Um, at, 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 at the risk of being um, impertinent, I want to disagree with the last comment that you oh, made. Please disagree. I'm, okay. I'm here for that. Okay. Um, and, and I'm going to do it from the perspective of uh, reassuring you, number one, and I hope this doesn't sound like a platitude, but I'm proud to be on that National Security Higher Education Advisory Board. The whole point of that, appointed by the director of the FBI, is for us to roll up our sleeves, so to speak, and work on these very problems that you're talking about. There's no question that what you've raised is a potential concern. No question about it. And there's no question that uh, both uh, uh, industrial espionage and other kinds of uh, espionage is a concern on, on sort of both sides of the street. Well, this um, isn't espionage. We're, I think we are handing people over things that that's cause the us. Well, that's the part that we have to do a good job on our side of doing it. But what I, the part I want to disagree with you about is that um, I believe that the uh, American public is uh, putting money into universities, certainly to educate Americans. Absolutely no question about it. But these kind of universities, research universities, you are, especially through this committee, thank goodness, putting hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars, depending on the agency, for uh, research that leads to innovation. And we have a complex innovation network, and I'm sorry to hit you with a cliche that seemed to upset you, but it is true that we're living in a global world and that we need, it is true, we need the best and the brightest to work on these complex but, but problems. But we have a pool. Uh, 
a great pool of Americans. By the way, we are Americans of every race, every religion. That's what's great about America. I'm a we Christian. Come, I'm we a come from everywhere. Don't we have a large pool of Americans that could then be trained rather than having to bring these people in from overseas to take the, to to participate in this and uh, adding value to their to their existence? Well, I think we're all facing the same direction you're trying to face. I'm a first generation American, first generation through higher education. Unfortunately, unfortunately. We're not doing as good a job in the STEM pipeline in this country as we need to be. And I, I feel silly telling this committee about it since you've been supportive of bills like H.R. 362, the 10,000 student, 10 million minds bill. I'm probably getting that wrong, but something like that in Title I. That if you keep doing what you are doing in this committee, you fund these federal agencies for research that will lead to innovation, you help us fill up the STEM pipeline, then what you're talking about may come to fruition someday. Right now, I need the brightest international students to fill out the programs that we have at our university. And no, I'm sorry to say that we're not doing a good enough job in the STEM pipeline in this country. And I'm glad afterwards to share with your staff oh, the data. Just, that's just so you on. know, I have been very supportive of our efforts to provide uh, uh, re uh, scholarships for, up for graduate level students uh, provided to make sure we meet these scientific needs in our country so that NOAA and NASA and the rest of these organizations could actually provide scholarships to make sure that our people are being trained. And I think to the degree that we have to bring in students, foreign students, uh, in to fill these slots, rather than training Americans, is a symbol of failure, not something that we should be bragging about. Thank the gentleman. One of the uh, things I particularly value about, about Mr. Rohrbacher is a willingness to present other sides of the story that needs to need to be presented, and I very well said. and. Uh, well responded to. I think at this point we've heard a, a, a number of uh, important insights and a fascinating, fascinating hearing on, on what is clearly going to be a growing trend, I think, and with important implications. Unless there are any uh, urgent final comments or questions from the panel, if, if uh, other members of the panel of the uh, uh, committee wish to submit comments or if uh, the members of our panel wish to, I'm sorry? Yeah. If our members of our panel wish to uh, offer additional remarks, we appreciate very much your time and testimony and uh, your work. We look forward to seeing you again, hopefully, down the road. And at this point, the uh, uh, committee stands adjourned. Thank you very much. For, uh... Thank you. Thank you. How we do a better job of playing.